rehearsals for the event have been held yesterday to light that sacred flame. And these live images coming into us uh, from Olympia at the moment. That flame, they will burn throughout the games here in Paris. Really is a very special event then, full of symbolism and ritual. We'll bring it to you in full here on France 24. I'm going to be joined by a series of guests as well. So do stay with us. So it is then a ceremony that harks back to the ancient Olympics when a sacred flame burnt throughout the games. And today it will be lit in ancient Olympia, the birthplace of the ancient games at the start of its epic torch relay from the Acropolis to the South Pacific to Marseille and then to here in Paris for the start of the games in July. Hundreds of dignitaries and spectators, as you can see already from these uh, live images coming into us, attending that ritual today in southwestern Greece, where the ceremony is held every two years, in fact, for the summer and winter Olympics. Olympics, as you can hear, we're already hearing uh, the uh, the Olympic hymn. Let's just have a little listen to that. That's the American uh, mezzo-soprano there, Joyce uh, Donatio, delivering the Olympic anthem. We're shortly, I think, going to hear the Marseillaise as well. So uh, I'll try and keep a little bit quiet because uh, it'd be nice to hear that if we possibly can. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to cross as well and talk to our correspondent, uh, Natalie Savaricus, who's at Olympia for us. Oh, I would just let's listen to the Marseillaise as well. Bye. 
So as the flag is uh, raised there after those uh, school children sung us the Marseillaise, of course, the French national anthem, let's talk to Natalie Savaricus, our correspondent, who's at that uh, ceremony for us. Natalie, uh, obviously the anticipation, anticipation has been building and we're now uh, underway. <laughs> A bit loud for Natalie to talk at that point, but Natalie, uh, just tell us then now about uh, what the atmosphere is like there. I can tell you one full of symbolism and emotion, a very moving start to uh, uh, the ceremony. Uh, we had the American mezzo-soprano singing, as you heard, the uh, Olympic anthem, followed by pupils singing both the Greek and the French uh, uh, anthems, are very moving. And now we will proceed, of course, with uh, a series uh, of speeches by dignitaries in this uh, ancient stadium where uh, the first uh, Olympics uh, kicked off uh, over 2,500 years ago. A very uh, moving day, uh, both for Greece and for France, as the spirit of peace, uh, unity and hope uh, is conveyed uh, throughout the world. Uh, the big question, of course, is uh, who will heed this message, uh, but uh, a great effort by the organizers here. Let's bring in as well Michael Payne. He's the former director of marketing for the International Olympic Committee. He's also author of TuneIn, which is the unofficial and entirely unsanctioned history of the Olympics. He's joining us as well on the programme. Thanks very much for being with us. We had a quick chat just before we came on air. You were telling me it's your 22nd Olympic Games you've been involved in now. Uh, that's correct, although I should add that summer and winter Olympic Games, but uh, Sarajevo in 1984 was my very first Olympic Games. Uh, I've also been privileged to run the Olympic torch six times, and it is, as your correspondent said, a, a very moving and symbolic experience. And presumably you've been w at one of these ceremonies, or a numerous number of these ceremonies as well. What's it like being there? It, it's very symbolic. You, you do, you're in a very peaceful place and you realize you're walking in the footsteps of history. That 3,000 years ago, the athletes from around uh, Greece and the region were coming here to compete. And that the history, the archaeology, I mean, it's, it's incredibly symbolic and moving. And having been, uh, you know, so close and so involved in the Olympic movement for so long, how good does it feel and, and, and seem to, you know, see it all kicking off once again and obviously it coming uh, eventually in the, a couple of months' time to us here in Paris and the rest of France as well? Well, I think everybody in the Olympic movement is, uh, bringing, is uh, breathing a big sigh of relief because the last two Olympic Games uh, were disrupted by COVID. Uh, it was still a miracle they actually happened, but there wasn't any atmosphere for the public to celebrate. And so I think there's a, a tremendous excitement, enthusiasm uh, for the Games going to Paris. I mean, such a symbolic great city. Uh, and the atmosphere you can really feel that 100 days to go is really building the mount. Michael, stay with us. I know you're going to uh, keep with us uh, for the rest of the programme as well. But let me bring in my uh, guest here on set as well. We've got James Fasina, our sports editor, and also our international affairs editor, Doug Herbert, uh, are both with me. Good to have you uh, with us as ever, gentlemen. Let's start with you, James. I mean, uh, this is all about symbolism, isn't it, what we're seeing today? But we've got to remember that at the end of the day, the whole event is about sport, isn't it? Yeah, and it's becoming, as you just said, uh, very real. We've just seen uh, just a few minutes ago, Tony Estonga, the, the, the man who's heading uh, the organisation for Paris 2024. Uh, Annie Hidalgo, also the mayor of Paris, the two people who've been working for years to get to this very moment. They're probably pinching themselves right now, thinking from the moments that Paris 
got that actual was able to secure the Olympics for this summer to this actually happening. This is the start. The flame is starting. It's not the actual start of the sporting, yes, but this is in a way the start of the Olympics because once the flame starts to the moment it ends, it turns out at the end. Well, that is the duration of the games, and of course we're going to have we're going to see this flame uh, being lit in just a few minutes, uh, and that is part of of course the whole ritual, the whole symbolism behind the games of what is holding everyone together. So it's it's all about the sport for now. There's going to be sport in a certain way, as we mentioned there, with the with the relay to come uh, over the couple months uh, before it's uh, it, it actually all kicks off in July. Uh, there's going to be a number of high-profile athletes, a number of less-known people who will be carrying that torch throughout France, throughout uh, territories, uh, throughout the islands uh, as well. And there's going to be plenty to see. We'll get we'll touch on that uh, just in a little bit. And we're about to hear also from Ben Tony Estonga, who's surely going to be, uh, as I said, they're pretty um pretty happy that all of this is happening uh, finally today that he's actually there in uh, S Olympia, uh, the site where 3,000 years ago this was obviously all around, a had a religious uh, side to it. Um, as we see, we're here in, in the uh, Temple of Hera, uh, which is, was the queen of all the Greek gods, uh, where everything uh, was happening. Of course, the Olympics weren't exactly what they were, what they've become uh, today. The modern Olympics are a version, an expanded version. It used to just be a single day uh, back in the time where there's just a sprint race. That gradually became what it's become today for that to last for weeks and take across uh, the whole world. But this is definitely kicking in now. Uh, for real. <laughs> and they're kicking in. I mean, that's what uh, the organisers are going to be hoping, aren't they, Doug? Because it's been a little bit flat so far here in Paris. I mean, I actually cycle right through Place de la Concorde on my way home from work, where a lot of these events are happening. Yeah. And you're sort of starting to get that tension building. You can see the works yes. going on. But a lot of people are still, uh, you know, not really sure how it's going to pan out here in Paris, would you say? Yeah, look, as James says, it's all about the sport, except for all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting here, as you, as you just said, a lot about the other stuff. Stuff. Look, uh, if there was a gold medal uh, given out, awarded for grumbling, discontent, <laughs> the French might get it. They have gotten it in a lot of polls. And look, they have this, uh, you might say it's this uh, canny ability to, um, you know, predict chaos in Armageddon ahead of big events and then to somehow in grand fashion to pull it off in stunning fashion. Um, and there's a sense right now that um, you're on sort of this cliff edge. Um, uh, the at least you read the French press, it's a sense of everything that can possibly go wrong just might go wrong. Uh, we have, uh, you know, threatened strikes from sectors uh, from the police uh, to hospital workers, to ambulance workers, to transport workers. Uh, while some of those have been resolved by throwing a little extra money at them because they're being asked, asked to work over their summer holiday season, uh, they're asking for overtime pay, for bonuses. So they're trying to iron out all of that. But beyond sort of just the, the, the public sector, the work the social uh, discontent. There's just a seemingly right now carte blanche for everyone to sort of express a slightly negative opinion. Now, the mood, if you're asking me about the actual mood, it's a, it's a, it's a weird sort of mixture, if you will, between on the one hand, there are polls that show that a majority of French, uh, just barely, if you're talking about the provinces, uh, Paris as well, a majority of France have confidence in their government, in the Olympic organizers. I'm just going to interrupt you. I'm just going to interrupt you because the president of Paris 2024, Tony Estanguet, is talking. Let's listen to him. Minister of Sports, Olympics, Paralympics, Amelie, members of the big family of Paris 2024 and of the big family of uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games, dear friends. Good morning. 2800 years ago, the Greek civilization celebrated for the first time the Olympic Games. 126 years ago in Athens, uh, there was a new edition of the Olympics uh, so that every four years the best athletes could uh, compete in a context of peace. 100 years ago, France had the huge honor to host for the second time the modern games. Here, we are in this marvelous place that brings us to peace and serenity. We are here facing the big story of Olympism that we can see everywhere around us. A history that has taken relay really in 1894 in the Parisian amphitheater of Sorbonne, thanks to one person. Pierre de Coubertin. We know what we owe to him, and thanks to his heritage, we have with France a very special link, and then back a link to Olympism. Here, in Olympia, we can see all traditional values, thanks to games, thanks 
To this heritage, we have to pay tribute to that. There can be different crises, but these are sports that will be a very important force of inspiration for the generations to come. The flame is a symbol of this heritage and of our mankind, of our humanity, because it makes the link between the ancient games and modern ones. It disseminates eternal values of tolerance and solidarity everywhere in the world. This symbol is also very powerful in sports because the flame has the power to touch a very big number in all places and it creates many emotions, it creates, it makes us bigger from one generation to other and invites all the lovers of sports and games. The flame is an allegory because it goes from family to friends, from a club to a sport. This is the great Olympism that is being conveyed person after person, flame after flame, a flame after flame. Our role is to do everything to make bigger this flame in our country and in the world. 100 years after the last edition that we hosted, the French people will have the honor and, of course, the big joy to host this 33rd edition of the Games. Today, France is ready to take the relay. After the participation of women in the Games of Paris in 1900, the first village of athletes in Paris in 1924, we are ready to write down a new page of the Olympic history. This summer. In the agenda of 2020, we are quite proud because the Games of Paris will not only be spectacular, but they are going to reply to the challenge of the century, climate change. I would like to thank particularly Thomas Bach, the president of the International Committee, because he has been always close to us. I would also like to thank the city of Paris, the French state, all different bodies in sports, in the private sector, mobilized for the success of our common challenge. I would like to thank them all for being here today. Together, we're going to organize big games, and this starts today with the lighting of the Olympic flame ceremony and the flame will travel throughout uh, France. We have the great honor to have with us a big athlete, Laurent Manodou. You have been captain in 1924 and it is an honor to be here. In Athens, 20 years ago, you have shown the way, you won medals, and this has been a very important moment. The first medal winner in Athens 24 and big success, of course, in Paris 2024. The symbolism is big for these Games of Paris. We are very happy to launch these Games with you and with this flame that we have been waiting for so much time. Allow me this uh, small emotion and I would like to say that there are millions of French people waiting for these Games that count on you to light up the flame. And now starts the biggest festivity in the world, the Olympic Games. Ladies and gentlemen, see you in Paris. See you in Paris 2024, 26th of July. Thank you. Yes, see you in Paris there, says uh, Tony Asenghi, the president of Paris 2024. We're expecting as well uh, in just a moment Thomas Bach, the president of the uh, International Olympic Committee, to uh, talk as well. I think he's going to come straight after. So let's uh, stay with the ceremony there happening in Greece to hear exactly what he has to say. You can see on the left there those uh, rings of the Olympic rings uh, laid out there by the children. I think Thomas Bach is just coming to the microphone as well. So let's hear what he has to say. The president of the Hellenic Republic, Your Excellency Katarina Sakir. Dear Olympic friends, Filimou, Elines, all protocol observed. On this sacred ground where we stand today, the great gift to humankind was born 2,800 years ago, the Olympic Games. We are grateful to the Greek people to this very day for this precious gift to all humankind. With the presence of the President of the Hellenic Republic, we are reminded 
of the direct connection between this ancient heritage and modern Greece. This is why I would like to thank you, Your Excellency, for gracing us with your presence to celebrate this auspicious moment with us. My thanks and gratitude uh, go also to our hosts, the Hellenic Olympic Committee, under the great leadership of my dear friend Spiros Kapralos, and the mayor of Olympia, who are playing such an essential role to preserve this noble heritage. Since ancient times, there is an inseparable link between the Olympic Games and peace. The sacred Olympic truce, the Ekecheria, was the foundation for the ancient Olympic Games to take place in peace, making them a symbol of hope. This idea of promoting peace and hope through sport was taken up by Pierre de Coubertin when he revived the modern Olympic Games nearly 130 years ago. Always the visionary, he said, the Olympic Games are a pilgrimage to the past and an act of faith in the future. The lighting of the Olympic flame for the Olympic Games Paris 2024 is exactly this, a pilgrimage to our past in ancient Olympia and an act of faith in our future in Paris. What better place to manifest our hope and faith in the future than Paris? Paris, the hometown of our beloved founder and renovator of the Olympic Games, Pierre de Coubertin. In ancient times, the Olympic Games brought together the Greek city-states, even and in particular during times of war and conflict. Today, the Olympic Games are the only event that brings the entire world together in a peaceful competition. Then as now, the Olympic athletes are sending this powerful message. Yes, it is possible to compete fiercely against each other and at the same time live peacefully together under one roof. The athletes will shine. The athletes will show us what greatness humans are capable of with all their excellence, determination and resilience. This power of sport will make the Olympic Games Paris 2024 a great symbol of human excellence and unity of all humankind in all our diversity. These expectations are shared by billions of people around the world. In these difficult times we are living through, with wars and conflicts on the rise, people are fed up with all the hate, the aggression, the negative news they are facing day in, day out. In their hearts, and I think in all our hearts, we are longing for something that brings us together. We are longing for something that is unifying us. We are longing for something that gives us hope. The Olympic flame that we are lighting today is the symbol of hope. This Olympic flame will carry this Olympic spirit from here our ancient roots through all of France and finally to Paris, making the city of light shine even brighter. The Olympic flame will shine over the first Olympic Games inspired by our Olympic agenda reforms from start to finish. These Olympic Games will be younger, more inclusive, more urban, more sustainable. These will be the very first Olympic Games with full gender parity, 
because the IOC allocated exactly 50% of the places to female and male athletes. Nos amis du Comité d'Organisation Paris 2024, sous le remarquable leadership de mon cher ami et collègue olympien Tony Estenguet, Tony Estenguet have truly worked in an extraordinary way to revive these games in every dimension. possible dimension. Mais plus vif, I would like to deeply thank and congratulate the whole team from today, the whole team of the Organization Committee, Paris 2024. Avec tous les acteurs du monde With all the bodies of the French sports world, the National Olympic Committee and all the political and social actors in France, all together, you have been brought to a very important objective in our agenda, that is to create a heritage for the Games before the ceremony of the flame. We are opening up the Games and you are here to make a really important moment in the Olympic history. Your initiatives and actions will promote education, inclusion, equality and a better environment. And these actions of yours have already a specific impact. You have a very important tool that will continue to mobilize people even after the Games with the uh, generation 24 and impact 24, you have reinforced uh, the sports practice and the Olympic values, especially amongst the youth. Another good example of heritage. The Olympic village of uh, Saint Saint Denis that uh, will be transformed to new accommodation for 6,000 people. A new bridge, the Olympic passerelle that will traverse the Seine and will link Saint-Denis to the city of Paris. The aquatic uh, center is a very important neighborhood where children will learn how to swim. The very important uh, efforts made to clean up sand for the Olympic Games, and these will mark a sustainable heritage for many generations to come in Paris and France. Thanks to these efforts, it will be again possible to swim into the Seine for the first time for the last 100 years. What could have been a better place other than Paris to revive our Olympic agenda? Paris, the famous city of our Olympic movement. Paris, the birthplace of our founder, Pierre de Coubertin. Paris, city of light, where he has created the model edition of the Olympics. We acknowledge the importance of France and these Olympic Games with their passion and enthusiasm. It's very important the fact that we are looking forward to celebrating with all French population and with uh, the whole world our... But have no fear, there is a backup flame uh, that was lit yesterday by the High Priestess, the actress Mary Minou there, uh, performing the uh, ancient ritual of lighting uh, her torch by focusing the sun rays on her curved mirror. Uh, and then the torch relay will begin to spread this message that Thomas Bach uh, did mention, one of the peace and one of the unity among humans, one message that is deeply needed in our times. Let's bring in Michael Payne as well, once again, former director of marketing for the uh, International Olympic Committee, also uh, author of TuneIn, which is the unofficial and entirely unsanctioned history of the Olympics. Michael, I mean, uh, we had a lot there, didn't we, about how we're all living through difficult times. Uh, you only have to watch France 24 to, to hear about those difficult times. But a lot of optimism at the same time about what the Olympic Games hopefully can, can bring to the planet, really, as it, as it uh, kicks off this summer. I was actually very surprised by President Bach's remarks because he was very blunt when he said the world is fed up. 
that's not necessarily your normal diplomatic uh, sort of statement that you hear from the president. But I think he captured the mood perfectly. The world is fed up, and the, the potential inspiration of getting all of the nations together in Paris, even if it's only for a brief moment in time, is a reminder of what it's like when you can bring humanity together. And we also had uh, those comments as well from Tony Estange talking about the fact that the Games were going to be spectacular here in Paris. Looking um, at it as you know the Olympic Games, what are your hopes for the Olympics here in Paris? I think they, they will be spectacular. You have an incredible, unique city. And, and part of the Olympic experience is as much as what goes on outside of the venue in the public domain as on the field of play. And that, that atmosphere of the crowds walking along the streets, the, the, the venues set against the iconic buildings, that all creates the magic. Uh, it's what makes the Olympics different. And, you know, I think the you will see as the torch hits the French territory that the popular support just explode. Don't you think that's the case? I mean, there's been uh, uh, some fears, haven't there, not just amongst what we were talking about earlier, the, the sort of Parisian perhaps hesitance to, to really get engaged by this, but also security fears, that kind of thing. We had uh, Emmanuel Macron admitting yesterday that there are plan Bs in place should there be a real security problem. Yeah, Stuart, what you're saying, I think, really is spot on because, you know, look, what Olympics do you not have? I was talking about grumbling and discontent, and obviously the French are, are, are you know, are not exceptional in this in this respect. Just about every Olympics uh, in the weeks and months leading up to it, there is some foreseen, even some unforeseen tragedy that is going to strike, that is going to prevent, that is going to rain on the parade quite literally. Um, and then in the end, you sort of forget about that when the actual show begins. And, and you know, what we were just talking about here, this this sort of ability of the French to to pull it off. And yes, you can't forget the, the, the pulling value, the magnet of attraction that is Paris, you know, the despite its hardships, despite the social unrest, despite, you know, the problems that a lot of big, uh, you know, cities and, and, and capitals are going through uh, at this moment in time, it does have that iconic status. And there is something to be said about the sheer visual element of it. When you have all of those crowds there, and remember, we are expecting crowds. You know, initially, uh, a few months back, they were saying there's going to be 600,000 uh, people outdoors. They've been sort of dialing down those numbers a little bit. Now what they're going to do as far as the the physical present, you know, those physically present to see the, the opening ceremony, it's going to be, and remember, it's going to be on the Seine River. This is the first time they're going to take it outside the walls of a stadium, and they're going to actually have it barges and boats going down the Seine, which is uh, quite an ambitious uh, feat to pull off. But as of now, that is the plan, at least. And uh, you're going to have, you know, 220,000 people watching from the upper levels, just the public, the general public. They'll reserve over 200,000 places on that upper level above the Seine. But on the Seine Riverbank, the, the paying spectators, when I say paying, uh, the, the, the ticket prices right now are ranging from anywhere from 24 euros to, I think, 2,700 euros. Wow. Those are just the official yeah. prices. We're not talking about, uh, you know, the, the black market, so to speak. But on the Senate, it's going to be just over 100,000. I think it's something like 104,000. So, yes, it's tightly restricted as far as the physical numbers present. But that is a lot of people. And it does show they're expecting massive crowds. And, yes, I do expect you're going to see a lot of enthusiasm among people who are going to be coming to Paris to see what they hope will be a spectacular uh, event. Yes, it's coming in a, in a very charged, difficult world conflict with two big wars going on. On Russia, Ukraine, Gaza. Uh, you have, yes, the Islamic State group rearing its head again most recently in the attack in Moscow. All of that, obviously, in the rearview mirror right now and, and, and looming large for security uh, planning. But as far as the enthusiasm, I do feel like it's a little bit like presidential races, big ones, especially like in the U.S. People don't actually start tuning in until really the days, the weeks just before the event when they realize, wow, the Olympics are really coming to Paris. It's going to be big. It's going to be spectacular. I think right now it's very easy to sort of focus on all that can go wrong and all the sort of things that can go awry. Mm. But we're, we're, that's where we are right now. But I do sort of agree with that, that once it happens, people are going to tune in in a very different way to these games. I think exactly what you say there, Doug. Uh, it doesn't even only just apply, as you said, not just to the Olympics. It applies to anything else. It happens, of course, with the World Cup in Qatar. We're having plenty of discussions, right. rightly, about human rights, about everything around it. Yeah. Uh, talks of boycotts and many people around and for for, for for obvious reasons, but 
Then when things happened, it kicked off. And yes, people did obviously start following the World Cup and it did work. What France is hoping is that today is going to be able to create that spark quite literally uh, in Paris. Because as you mentioned just earlier on, uh, Stuart, there's Within Paris itself, we're not, we, we, we haven't seen for now that many like, celebrations. There's not much going on. You don't see that the Olympics are happening. The most that we see are uh, billboards going in, 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 the, in the undergrounds telling us that, uh, that, that it's going to be complicated for us to be taking the uh, transports uh, during the Olympic Games. There's not much of that celebration. Lots of construction. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of roadworks. <laughs> Lots of that. We've seen plenty of it. Um, I, I wonder if, if perhaps Michael Payne could, uh, could tell us just a bit from, from your side, from the... Um, from the International Olympic Committee, is there much for, uh, how, how much overview does the committee have on how, whether the country is managing to promote this well uh, with, uh, with, with the citizens of, uh, of that country, so in this case with Parisians and French people at large? with the local organizing committee and the the promotion of the games how you make sure that it is a national event as opposed to just being in the city uh, is a key part that the IOC tries and guides the committee on over the seven-year build-up uh, I think when the torch this this always happens the moment the torch lands the, the nation suddenly it comes alive and embraces it also as your, as your colleague said before every single games, there are political issues, there are all sorts of problems and crises that dominate the media coverage. We're just watching One, here the, uh, oh sorry Michael, I thought you'd finish, I was saying we're just watching yeah. here the uh, representatives, uh, they're going up to the, the Temple of Hera for the, uh, the, the lighting of the flame, we'll continue to watch, watch that as well. Do carry on, sorry I interrupted you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I was just saying, the IOC, the Paris organizers, they're praying for one moment for the sport to start. Because the moment the opening ceremony is behind them, the sport takes over the news, and that's how it should be. OK, well, we'll keep watching those images. I'm going to bring in, um, as well, in just a few moments, uh, time, Ray Basil. She's an international trap shooter. She became the first Arab woman to compete in two Olympic Games. She uh, competes for Lebanon, in fact. She won three consecutive World Cup medals in trap shooting. She's now trying in the Olympics this summer for a fourth time. Great to have you with us on the programme. I don't know whether you heard some of those um, speeches a few moments ago, but a lot of uh, hope, really, for, for sports people. We, had to, uh, we heard from uh, Tony Stangi saying sport has the power to touch many places. Do you feel uh, optimistic and enthused by all of that? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, this Olympics, actually for us as athletes, it's the ultimate thing that we all wish that it really passes uh, in a very good way, and especially what's happening around, uh, around us. I think it's a bit chaotic for everyone, but I really hope that this Olympic game will be one of the best. I know you're also a goodwill ambassador for, for young people and for, for women as well in sport. And we heard that mention of, of there being a real 50-50 uh, split and that uh, assurance that there will be uh, equality at these games. Actually, yes. This is the first Olympic Games that they secured 50% uh, places for men and women, which is for gender equality. And I believe this is something very important, especially nowadays and in the Middle East and the Levant and everywhere in the world. This approval so that women have states at the Olympic Games and, and yes, we can as, as any man can do. So today we can say that for the first time in history, sport has become equally for both for men and for women. And as I said, it's the fourth time you're going to compete in the Olympic Games uh, yes. this year. What are your hopes for, for Paris 2024? Well, I really hope that this Olympic game will bring a medal for Lebanon. Lebanon never had an Olympic medal for the past 50 years, and my aim is to really put back Lebanon on the on the on the on the scheme of the Olympic medals. So uh, I really hope I can do this. I'm at this moment in Italy training and preparing for for the event, and I really hope that after four Olympics. That would be the one and the day that Lebanon will have and earn a medal. I really hope to make it, to make this come true. Good to hear that. Well, let's just have a little um, dip into these pictures and listen to some of the sound as well. You can hear the, the bird song, which is incredible uh, to, to hear as the ceremony goes on. So we'll just keep quiet for a few minutes and uh, listen to, to the sounds and watch some of that ceremony.
θάλασσα και υπνοές των ανέμων, όροι και τέμποι. Σιγήστε, ήχοι και φωνές πουλιών, πάψατε για τη μέλη να μας συντροφεύσει ο φίβος, ο φωσφόρος βασιλεύς. Απόλλωνα, θεέ του ήλιου και της ιδέας του φωτός, έστειλε τις ακτίνες σου και άναψε την Ιερή Δάδα για τη φιλόξενη πόλη του Παρισιού. Και εσύ, Δία, χάρισε ειρήνη σ' όλους τους λαούς της γης και στεφάνωσε τους νικητές του Ιερού Αγώνα. Just waiting now for the uh, lighting of the flame happening there live as we see it happen. Let's uh, watch that. That was the prayer to uh, the god Apollo there for the lighting of the flame. And what is, of course, the ulcer of, uh, of the sacred site. And there it is then, the flame uh, lit. Obviously they decided there was not enough uh, sun, unfortunately, to light it using that uh, elliptical uh, device or whatever it's called behind them uh, there. But uh, James, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a moment that kind of tugs at you, doesn't it, really? It sort of makes you think, okay, this is, this is real now, this is happening. Yeah, that's it. That's the, that's the start, that's the fire that's gonna keep burning uh, throughout the, the, the months to come. Uh, yep, the official starts to the Olympic Games and the uh, flame that's going to be going then across. Uh, first, this is going to be crossing uh, a couple of days across Greece. Uh, we're going to be seeing it handed to the first torchbearer uh, in just a few minutes. So Stefanos Duskos, uh, rowing champion, uh, who won uh, gold in the single schools. That was in 2020 in the last uh, Games in Tokyo. And after that, well, we had conf uh, confirmation then that it's Laure Manoudou who will be the first French, uh, French athlete to pick up the flame. She'll be picking it up from him just after that Laure Manoudou who, uh, as we heard from uh, Tony Stonga there, uh, it's quite symbolic for her. Of course, she won gold uh, back in uh, Athens then, uh, 20 years ago. And so we'll be spending uh, about, uh, just, just about 11 days uh, in Greece before the plane then heads all its way to Marseille aboard the Belen boats. Yeah, and then of course after that it goes through this uh, great passage all the way around France, even to, to some of the overseas territories that France has as well. Yeah, it's going to go going all the way, and uh, it's quite quite incredible. So they've restored so what is a, a, a three mast uh, boat, uh, the Belen Ben, uh, very very old boat uh, in France, which will be carrying it then from uh, from Greece to Marseille before it goes through uh, through France, and uh, it will leave from Brest to go to uh, the overseas territories over. All uh, in the Caribbean, also to the Réunion, over uh, down, uh, which is uh, to the uh, southern east uh, off the coast of Africa, uh, and taking it where then all the way to the um, what's known as then the Dum Dum, the overseas territories, uh, to bring more inclusion to uh, to them. So that it isn't just about the mainland, just isn't just about Paris. That of course, from what uh, we've heard from people speaking over there, it's very important to be able to see, of course, that the flame that the Olympics are also uh, taking part uh, over there because it's uh, just too easy for it just to all happen in Paris, as so often does. Uh, but at least it'll bring some inclusion. It'll spend some time there before coming back to France, go all the way around France, and there's going to be plenty of landmarks. And we're going to be following that, of course, over the coming months because there's going to be, it's all part of, it, there's, there's a lot behind it. It's not It's not just about the flame, it's about the stories of the people who've been, who'll be carrying it, 10,000 people who'll be carrying uh, the 
uh, the flame uh, throughout. Some of them famous. We have some uh, of the big names. Thomas Pesquet, who you have probably heard about, one of the French astronauts on board uh, the International uh, Space Station, who's been going there. Jean-Pierre Pierre Papin, the uh, former footballer uh, there. And uh, also the likes of uh, possibly Jamel Debbouze, the French comedian. So it's not just about the sports, it's about bringing the countries together. And also those are some of the famous names, uh, but there's a lot of just local people, people who've done a lot for the sports. Uh, one example uh, is Mark, who's a 70 year old man. He's, he's uh, climbed the uh, climbed Mount Everest eight times and he'll be part of this. So this is gonna be something, as, this, is, this is gonna be a very small yeah. exercise for him, <laughs> taking the breathing <laughs> over, over a couple of, <laughs> couple of meters. Uh, Aya, who's 21 years old as well. She works a lot in the developing, de developing sporting activities uh, in disadvantaged neighborhoods. So it's just about symbolism, about everyone being able to be um, all part of this as the flame uh, makes its way to Paris. Michael, that's what's so great about the Olympics, isn't it? It does bring everyone together, as James was talking about there. It's not just about the sports, is it? I mean, a lot of it, obviously, the foundations of it are about sport, but it becomes a sort of enveloping thing that kind of sucks in the, certainly the people of the nation that were involved, but the people around the world, even. No, absolutely. And I mean, some of my most unique and special Olympic moments and memories have actually been about the torch relay. And particularly when they collect the runners, they bring them together as community heroes. And you listen to the stories of what these community heroes have done. And it just becomes a very sort of symbolic moment. And I think the, the stories, there will be the sort of the, the high profile names running. But often it's that the local community who's been serving the school, the hospital for 30, 40 years, serving disadvantaged communities, that becomes the real power and celebration of the torch relay. Let's just listen to uh, a little bit of the, the music here as the ceremony continues. Watching that ceremony for us at uh, Olympia is Natalie Savarakris, a correspondent who's uh, there. Natalie, you've got a, a special guest for us that uh, you're going to talk to as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm here with Enric Gibert, the captain of the Belém, the uh, sailing boat uh, that will transport the Olympic flame of the 2024 Summer Games from Greece to France on the 26th of April, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Emery, thank you very much for being here. Please tell us uh, really uh, the honor that you must feel uh, transporting and the, the challenges that must be involved in transporting the flame to Paris. Yeah, for sure. I have uh, no words to say uh, how much we are honored by uh, the responsibility to carry the Olympic flame uh, from uh, Athens to uh, Marseille first. It's 
gonna be the first move of the Olympic flag under the French color, so that's for us a big symbol. Uh, we have some uh, young people to help us to, to carry this flame, some young people in the insertion association. So Foundation Belém Caisse de Paris is very proud of the objective and uh, a great thanks for the uh, Olympic organization and uh, all the organization to, to let us try this aventure. And it's gonna be the first time that the Olympic flame will be carried to uh, the oyster country by uh, ship. So, Tell us a bit about that. What are the challenges involved in carrying a flame uh, on board a plane? Yeah. Uh, carry the flame is like a very VIP uh, passenger. Uh, we're going to secure her and uh, of course have a hard moment with uh, this flame. It's going to be uh, sound by all the world and uh, for a few moments we have all this flame from a few people. It's like uh, inimaginable. You can say uh, what's going to be us for us. And, uh, because there is a symbolic, because uh, the responsibility is very hard, we have to, to, to say our no, 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 same, rise our same. So uh, it's going to be a big challenge, of course, but it's safe. And, uh, we hope that we're going to be at time, of, for sure, we're going to be at time at Marseille for this fantastic ceremony of uh, coming uh, in Marseille with the flames. So it's going to be a big arrival for uh, the, the world, the world uh, city of everybody. Last quick question. What are the the flame, so that's the first objective. The secret safety is not involved because it's very uh, secure and we have the system on board. And uh, just one last thing, the big symbol that the ship got the same age as the French Olympic Games, 1896, the same age for the first so the, the symbolic is very high for us. That's Ibrick Jibé, the captain of the Belém, uh, which will transport the ship to Marseille uh, from Greece. Thanks very much, Natalie. Hopefully you could uh, just about work out uh, what he uh, was saying there. It's very difficult with the sound, but let's listen to a little bit more of the ceremony while that uh, loud music is continuing. If you're just joining us, uh, you're watching a special program that we've been bringing you for an hour now as the uh, Olympic flame is lit at Olympia, the start of its uh, voyage to us here in Paris for the Olympic Games, of course, in uh, just over four months' time. 
uh, that we will be covering, of course, here on France 24 as well. We're just waiting for the uh, flame to be given to the first torchbearer. And uh, James Cassina, our sports editor, is uh, one of those who's joining me here on set. James, we're, it's a, that is a big moment of the ceremony, I suppose, once it's been lit, that moment that it's passed to the first torchbearer, ready for this uh, epic uh, race, if you like, or movement of that flame right around Greece, then to France and to the overseas territories as well. Yeah, of course. And once it actually, uh, this is when it when it all, all kickstarts, and uh, we'll be going around then uh, around uh, Greece and making its way uh, towards us here. And uh, the flame, of course, is, as we heard from uh, from the captain of the bed, and the challenges of uh, not letting it uh, uh, turn turn out at any point. Now, just to, in case you're wondering, there are some backup flames uh, that are kept from the original uh, fire that's, uh, that, that's from which they've all come from, in case anything should happen. Of course, there are many attempts uh, that happen throughout of uh, trying to sabotage uh, the, the lighting or attacks on the flame um, itself. And that is, of course, part of the whole security that's uh, here in France. The, the police force, security forces have been rehearsing for that. You've had towns, you've had villages that are going to be welcoming, uh, that are going to be part of the, the flame. Think of like the Tour de France where you welcome uh, one stage of the tour. Well, this, these are towns that are welcoming a stage for the flame and they've been preparing for all of this because it's quite a costly um, event for them to do. But it's historic. It's been a 100 years since the last time that the Olympics uh, took place in France. It's not something uh, that we expect to see again uh, in our lifetime necessarily. Who knows? But that is the anyway, the vision that everybody is going with this, that this is exceptional. This is a one time a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity for the French people uh, and plenty of them uh, to prepare ahead of uh, its, uh, its travels across to France. And we were mentioning that it was taken going to take a um, board on board the, uh, the Belem. Uh, ship there across to Marseille. That Belém ship that was 100 years ago was in charge of going to Brazil to bring cocoa beans back uh, for uh, France. Well, that has been uh, restored and is being used again. Uh, now, after that, though, to go to um, the Caribbean, the French Caribbean islands, it will be going on a, a, a trimaran, uh, which will be sailing then through uh, through the Atlantic to get there, so slightly different. But it's not the first time, of course, the plane has taken these uh, different methods. It's been through planes before. It's been through almost to space as well. So, um, so the flame is used to, to, to traveling pretty well. <laughs> yeah, Michael, uh, you're, I know you're a bit of an expert on the, the past people that have covered that flame. There are some particularly interesting examples, aren't there? Give us an idea of some of those people that really stick in your mind as to who has uh, carried the flame in the past. Oh, so there are so many. I mean, one personal one. I was in New York one month after the 9-11 attack uh, in the TV studios at NBC and in walked in a New York fireman in all of his regalia uh, to be interviewed. And he started saying, well, I was one of the lucky ones. I was one of three brothers. At least I survived. And frankly, everybody in the room cracked up because uh, his two brothers were buried under the 9-11 towers. Uh, we organized then for him to run the Olympic flame in memory of his brothers uh, in New York. Um, you have other stories. Uh, all the runners get together on a bus as they're dropped off along the relay, and you're asked to tell a story as to why you were selected. And so one runner was saying how they were a uh, cancer survivor uh, and had had a transplant. And the lady next to her, who the runner didn't know, said, oh, I was a donor. Mm. And the recipient didn't realize that she was going to receive the torch from the lady who'd wow. given her her kidney to survive. Oh, well, that's a great that's story, story, isn't it? And again, it's about bringing ordinary people into it, isn't it? it, it absolutely. And it's, it's, it's actually part of the sort of what makes the Olympics special. Even the 10,500 athletes, uh, people have relatives, they have friends. It's not as if you're dealing with sort of football superstars. These are people living your next door neighbors and have an incredible story and commitment for what it means to get to the Olympic Games. Yeah, we were representative, of course, for, of, of the Olympics, because it wasn't until that long ago, really, that professional athletes weren't actually part of the Olympics. This was part of just this was just general uh, general public that was uh, that were competing in them. Yeah, we can see the torchbearer there, the first torchbearer. Uh, Stefanos Duf, of course, there. Taking the, and taking the olive branches as well, uh, I noticed there, which, of course, is a sign of peace. The olive branches, which uh, they were crowns, of course, uh, back in the day. Mm. That's all they'd received for, for their heroics. Let's have a listen once again uh, as the 
the peace dove is released to. Some good camera work there. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> You know, it's lovely just watching and listening to those um, sounds there at Olympia and the, the symbolism and the, all those excited crowds there all gathered to uh, see this uh, very special ceremony that we've been watching over the last hour. La grande prêtresse, les courants et les prêtresses après le frémissement du silence, cette magnifique chorégraphie, le frémissement du silence sacré quitte. And now so the flame is off and uh, Tusco Sen will be uh, passing by the uh, monuments for Pierre de Coubertin, his, his heart actually, so it's Pierre de Coubertin, the, uh, the architects behind the modern Olympic Games, the French architects, uh, his heart was actually buried not far away from this site here and uh, that's a ritual to uh, be passing the, taking the flame uh, past the monuments where his heart then is uh, buried and where uh, Laure Manodou after that, the Olympic swimmer, the, uh, the sister of uh, Florent Manoudou will be uh, the first French person to be taking charge of the, uh, of the flame in Greece. Uh. Michael, what's it like, uh, you know, you were director of marketing for the International Olympic Committee for so long. How difficult is it to get the balance right? Because what we're seeing here is obviously a, a very traditional, very ancient ceremony. But at the same time, you need to keep the, the Olympics modern and relevant for the, the younger era as well, don't you? Uh, absolutely, but the, the symbolism and history and heritage that you're seeing here is key uh, to the traditions and, and why the Olympics are so unique. But then again, when you look at the sports program, uh, Paris is introducing new sports such as breaking. Uh, four years ago in Tokyo, you had skateboarding and surfing. So there's a permanent renewal of the sports program and what the youth uh, are engaged with, are interested in, but connected to the power of 3,000 years of history. It's very difficult, though, isn't it? Because on the one hand, yes, you want to keep it relevant and fresh, but on the other hand, you know, critics will inevitably say that it's wrong to drop some of the other sports, perhaps, that have been part of the Olympics for so long. Well, I was involved with trying to re-engineer modern pentathlon, the sport that was founded by the Pierre de Coubertin. Uh, and you have to evolve, and uh, we took the decision last year to drop the equestrian events and replace them by obstacle ninja warrior racing. Uh, you, you can't have a sport on the program that nobody practices or very few people practice. So th there's a, an ongoing uh, evolution and to find a balance uh, because you want to suspect, you want to respect you know, the traditions of the great sports like wrestling uh, and archery. Uh, and it's that mix that also makes it so special. Often, you know, it's the only time these sports get any real global exposure uh, when they're twins with the classic sports of track and field and swimming. And it's, of course, a way of attracting new audiences as well, because you get, for the likes of climbing that came back uh, with, with the Olympics, you'll get a new audience that's going to be following that, but they're going to be following, of course, the rest of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Same with the skateboarding, same with the surfing. So I can imagine, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of thought behind all of that to, to keep everything going, as Michael Payne is saying there, and to, to modernise it whilst respecting the, uh, the traditions, but to keep, it, to, keep, to, keep, to keep the flame going, really. I remember reading a tweet from somebody during the, I think it was probably during the London Olympics, actually, saying, I can't believe I've just spent the last uh, the rest of the afternoon watching curling um, and saying <laughs> how sure. sucked into it they got. Yeah, uh, and that's part of it, isn't it? Yeah, it's part of the opportunity that you get from, because these are not necessarily, many of the sports, and many people don't know the names of many of the people who are competing in, in, in these Olympics. So it's a chance to be actually looking at something that we're not necessarily following uh, uh, outside of the Olympics. And same goes, as you say, with the sports. So for people to be able to discover, uh, perhaps get a new interest, who knows, that person, maybe uh, somebody watching the curling and maybe yourself, I don't know, maybe, maybe you were trying to join a club at some point, but yeah. this is what, what's, uh, what could happen, especially 
as is always mentioned, for the younger people. Uh, this is inspiration to see the competition, to see uh, dreams literally happening for, for, for many. This is what they, they want. And this is what we can see here then. Uh, Pierre de Coubertin's heart, uh, which is buried just there. And that is uh, part of the ritual of the uh, lighting the flame to pass in front of that, uh, that monument that's, uh, that bears his name there. Michael, tell us a bit about who uh, Pierre de Coubertin is, because uh, you know, not everyone will know, will they? Well, Pierre de Coubertin was, was a French educationalist uh, who, towards the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, went to study the role of sport as a vehicle for education, particularly in, in England. Uh, and he decided that it would be wonderful if you would have the rebirth uh, of the Olympic Games. And he created in 1894 the International Olympic Committee uh, with a group of uh, mainly European nobles to try and resurrect the ancient Olympic ideal of, of the Games. We were talking of inspiration just there. That's uh, Lord Menodou then uh, taking up charge of the, uh, of the flame. And if I can speak for myself, of course, this was 10 years ago, well, uh, 20 years ago, uh, much, much younger. Well, I was much younger. We were all much younger. But for me, watching this, when she was uh, she was uh, competing, then it was definitely an inspiration because her name was absolutely everywhere. She represented mm -hmm. France in the swimming. She's absolutely huge. Of course, her brother has taken over after her. But uh, but this is it's what it's all about. And it's no, uh, it's no um, just uh, it's not by chance that she's ended up becoming the first French person to be taking charge of the flame there for the uh, for the Paris 2024 Olympics. Yeah, off it goes on that on that route. It's it's a long route, isn't it? It's, it's a long route, and it will come to an end um, when it does arrive in Paris. And that's another big part, of course, of the route is who is going to be the last person to be uh, carrying the flame, who's going to be lighting the cauldron. Of course, in the past, we've had some spectacular moments, and but sometimes it is also about just the smaller, uh, smaller what, what it means, the message behind them. You think, of course, back to the London 2012 and the likes of uh, uh, the likes of David, David Beckham carrying uh, the flame down the River Thames, uh, or Muhammad Ali back in Atlanta. If this is something, if Paris is trying to pull off what they're saying and what will be, if they man if everything goes right and everything happens on time. It's absolutely spectacular games which are taking place then outside the stadium and in these historic landmarks. If they want to make it big, who are they going to choose as uh, wow. for, for, for the last uh, torch bearer? Well, that is still uh, still secret. We're going to only find out, of course, in the last moments. There's a couple of names that have come out there. Uh, Jose Marie Pirec, uh, one of the big uh, big names in uh, French uh, Olympic times, could be the person. Um, I've got many other names. Uh, one person in particular in mind who could be a surprise, because when you think about it, you've got to find someone else. Well, if they wanted to find someone who's going to uh, be recognized in all of the world, of course, she is, she is big, but I'm also thinking of uh, the likes of Zindin Zidane. Uh, if he did step up uh, <laughs> at the last moments, uh, could cause, could, could make that ceremony um, absolutely huge. It's, incre it's incredible in a way that we don't know yet, isn't it? Because a lot of other names who are, are going to be involved in the ceremony, there have been some controversies as well over people who are going to be involved in the ceremony have, have been announced, but we still don't know that that one big name, if you like. No, we're never going to find out until the end. They're going to stay secret on that. That's part of, uh, yeah. it's all part of this, and uh, so we make sure that we keep watching the, Ooh, the relay. <laughs> I think they had a worry there if they couldn't get the torch to life, but they seem to have, they seem to have they seem to have managed it. Let's just bring in Doug Herbert uh, once again, Doug, briefly uh, before we're going to have to close soon. But um, you know, we we've seen the the, the the flame lit once again on its way to Paris. Still those security uh, concerns and how well this is all going to go. It seems to be going incredibly well right at the start, but it's such a long, drawn out process, isn't it? With so many different places that it's going to pass. So many different places it's going to pass, but I have to say, as you know, as far as security goes, I mean, the focus is obviously on securing Paris because they want to make sure that uh, at least the, the the opening ceremony on July 26, and we were talking about how many hundreds of thousands of physical spectators, not to mention the the, the billions watching around the world, um, they want to make sure that it is secure and as safe as as this ceremony in a relatively peaceful corner of Greece is is going right now. And and you know they are pulling out all stops. They're expecting you know. I think 45,000 police and gendarmes in Paris alone, and that's not counting an additional 15,000 soldiers that they're going to uh, conscript to uh, to also provide extra.
extra security. Uh, 10,000 of them are going to be in Paris alone. They're going to be closing the airspace around the capital. I think uh, something like a 50-kilometer radius, if I don't have that wrong. And, and they're going to be deploying all of these special all of the elite of the elite uh, of the police intervention and riot brigades uh, in France, uh, really around the Seine and the Paris, the, the Paris region. That's where they really want to make sure that this goes safely. And, you know, just the other night, you know, Emmanuel Macron was asked, you know, uh, will it be uh, on the Seine River? Because there had been a lot of speculation that they might, uh, that they might not. There is a plan B, there's a plan C. There might be a plan Z going right through the alphabet. But as of now, they are still planning on doing it on the Seine River, what they hope will be one of the most spectacular ceremonies in Olympic history. But yesterday Just, was the first time that we did hear, actually, there was a plan B and plan C. Because, right. of course, in mind, right. we were thinking, what happens if it isn't possible? And Emmanuel Macron was pretty clear when he talks about a terrorist threat. If that was too big, what would, they ha what would happen then? Plan B would be in front of the Eiffel Tower. Plan C could be in the Stade de France, which is serving as the Olympic venue. Great which only holds 80,000. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great to have you both uh, with us, of course, uh, on the programme for the programme today. Doug Herbert, International Affairs commentator. James has seen it, our sports editor. Thanks as well to you, Michael, very much for joining us. Michael Payne, uh, former director of marketing for the International uh, Olympic Committee. You've been watching a very special programme to see that flame. It has been lit. We saw that uh, wonderful ceremony uh, there at Olympia. It's on its way now around Greece uh, before it heads to uh, Marseille on the 8th of May. I'm sure we'll be covering that event for you here on France 24 and a lot of the events as well as that flame makes its way around France and the overseas territories. Stay with us on France 24 for a lot more coverage of the build up to the Olympics and the Olympics themselves at the end of July and the beginning of August. Hello and welcome here on France 24. Our guest today is Abdullah Hamdok. He is uh, the head of Sudan's Takadome. It's a